off and um, for the rest of the service. And secondly, I want to just hit Wednesday night again, 545 fried chicken right here, live, five chi fried chicken. And then we have a Warner and a Wednesday night service, Revelation chapter 11 this week. Definitely our passage. All right. Colossians chapter 2. <coughs> How many this morning have been baptized? Right, that's right. Well, most of you. How many have survived it? <laughs> you did. So no one kept you down. Hardly, hardly. I dropped one person one time. I almost lost them. But they're, but they're good. Now, um, how many, um, when you got baptized, how many took your wallet out of your pocket? <laughs> Most of you got baptized with your wallet. Well, you know, I'm not talking to guys now because I realize ladies don't have wallets in their pocket. But guys, when you were baptized, did you have a bathing suit on, shorts? Did you actually take the wallet out of your pocket? Because I did when I got baptized. I took the wallet out of my pocket. So, oh, yeah, everyone, okay, good. Ladies, your purse, did you take your purse in the baptismal with you or the ocean and go down with it, come up? Probably not. You probably left the purse behind. So that's, I'm realizing here, I'm trying to find out why financial problems are so difficult in, God, in the church of, God, uh, church of Christ. I think I figured it out. I'm going to sell this idea to other ministries around the world. Our wallets haven't been baptized. That's the, that's the problem. <laughs> So we've made discipleship, all sorts of different things, and we've, we've done, made all these decisions, but we've never baptized our wallets and our purses. So, we, um, so that has kept the church sometimes from giving what the church could give and, and really should give and needs to give. Now, with that said, the, money, the message isn't going to be all about money. But in light of what Pastor Brian brought out the last two weeks here in our stewardship series, this is going to be just a, a small period at the end of that sentence because he talked a lot about money management and debt and getting out of debt and paying off bills and paying as we go and, and, and not buying things that we can't afford. Like, and with my wife here watching, she, she, like, I want an 84-inch flat screen TV. <laughs> and, and, um, and in fact, I don't only think I want one. I, I need one. I, I, I sense it's something I really need to have joy in my life. So there is so, so but she's content with our 46-inch um, plasma TV, which I just think she's getting really stubborn on some of these things and things like that. But I'm saying that half funny because um, in America, we want wants drive us. And in the light of what Brian said, um, Learn to live, I mean, within your means. I mean, this is what he taught us. Learn to pay as you go. Me and my wife do, um, took on these principles back you know, over a decade and a half ago, and we retired all credit card debt. We, we drive older cars um, because we don't have any car payments, and, um, and we are very close to being debt-free. So it's, um, so it's please, um, I encourage, it's a great way to live. I don't have an 84-inch flat screen TV. But the 46 to get, yeah, but the 46 inches is just working fine, and, and, um, and the cars work fine. And so, please, that's in light of what Brian said. With that said, what we didn't cover a lot the last two weeks is the principle of giving. I want to touch with that a little bit. Now, first of all, when you look in your wallet, what do you find? Okay. What's in your wallet? Isn't that a, like a commercial out there? What's in your wallet? Okay. We look at what do you find? Well, here's, in mine, I got a Chick-fil-A card. Any, any wonder? Uh, who doesn't have a Chick-fil-A? Well, I'm sorry. This isn't any Chick-fil-A card. This is a preferred member Chick-fil-A <laughs> card. They know me when I walk in. I have a badge that goes in. This is my BJ's per Premier Rewards card. So that's from BJ's Restaurant, best jambalaya in town. This is my Panera card. Just happen to go there every now and then every week. <laughs> and, um, and then this is my Red Robin royalty card. Red Rob Royalty, Red Robin, best burgers in town. I mean, guaranteed to give you a triple bypass within two weeks after eating them. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's, uh, so this is, this is, this literally was in my wall. I'm thinking, geez, maybe I need to baptize my, my belly because <laughs> I guess I, I, um, did I leave my stomach out of this? And, and when you look inside your wallet, you find all sorts of stuff in there that really represent a lot more than money. Here's one that meant money, credit card, but not any credit card. What type of credit card can you see on there? Red Sox credit card. Thank you, Doug. Does anyone have one? We have applications in the back, and you can, you can get them today. Um, I have a vitamin card in here. I have a triple A card. My driving needs to be baptized <laughs> into the Lord, and some of the, you know, that's true. Um, now, here's something else I have. Now, I'm going to talk about three things we find in every wallet. Here's one. This isn't that funny. Nope. 
family pictures. We have family pictures. Those are my kids. And um, we find them, and now you probably have them in your wallet. Many of them have them on our phones now. We have, I have them in both. So I have, I have family pictures. And so I ask the question, have I baptized my family? When I was baptized, did my family be baptized? Was my family baptized also? What happens sometimes in Christian families, and a couple different things happen in two different directions, we sometimes, as parents, we like to keep our, f- our family and our Christianity separate. And really, they're an extension of each other. Our Christian life, our Christian family should be there simply to be part of the plan of God and the will of God in our life and to bring glory to God in the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about making your family come to church every week, but I do understand that coming to church, Hebrews 10, 25, and the gathering of the saints together is part of your Christian life. That's part of my walk with God. That's when I gather with other saints. We break bread together. We hear the word of God. The word of God spoken to us. We fellowship together. We, give, we, sac- we worship through giving and praise during a worship service. So that is important. But I think what's happened in America sometimes is we take our families. This is our family life and this is our church life. When God doesn't want them separated. He wants them all the same. Now, that's going to look different for every, every family. I'm not saying that every, you have to be in every church service and every church function. I would say that would be probably wrong. But to understand this, that your family is a gift from God and was given to give glory to God. See, I want my kids, when they grow up, to know that me and my wife stood for something. We stood for something, a priority system in our, in our lives. There were certain things that were top in our, in, our, in our lives, and our Christian life wasn't part of our life. It was our life. Now, I made the mistake as a young man, as a young dad, of putting ministry up there with Christianity, and sometimes they're very similar and one and the same, but oftentimes they're not. And, and, I had, and I made the mistake as a young man, as a young pastor, not knowing how to say no. I thought I had to do everything when everyone asked. And my favorite line to my children growing up in the early days was, when I have time, realizing that time wasn't growing on any trees in my yard. And, and, and no matter how much I thought waited for time, it never really showed up at my doorstep. So I had to make time. It took me a few years to figure that out. I'm a slow learner. But my family at that point, I want my kids to look back and see my dad or my mom, they stood for something. And something that drove their life. It was the umbrella of their their decisions. It drove everything they did. They stood for a Christian faith that permeated our home life and it permeated our our financial life and it permeated our recreation life. Our Christian life permeated all of it. One of the most amazing things, I'm going to move on in a second here, that I've watched through the years is my wife impart our Christian faith to our children. There is nothing ever wasted in our home. There's never a lesson. There's never an event. There's never anything taught that that somehow my wife doesn't turn this around and make it a teaching moment for our children. I've watched her do this for many years now with all the kids, and it's one of the amazing things to how she is integrated. And I don't think she has a plan to do it. This sort of happens. That's how she works. And her, she's integrated her Christian life, our Christian values, our convictions, our principles into everyday life. We homeschool. That wasn't, we felt it was necessity in our family, especially the last couple of years. Um, but even with that, there's frequent breaks in the lessons and something far beyond what they're learning is being imparted. Um, of integrating everyday life under the umbrella of our Christian faith. So when I b- baptize, I want to make sure I baptize my family too. My family is yours, God. It's yours, and it's for your glory. It's for your kingdom. And then, yes, the, I want to baptize my money. Simply said, has my money gone down with me? Have I, have I been, when I baptize, did my financial resource get baptized with me and came up um, some, with something as a new creature in a sense? Now, there are numerous reasons why people don't give, and I, I'm not going to get into all of them. But quickly, the first is the disease that I called cheapitis. <laughs> it's been around forever. It, it, it's, it's a reoccurring disease, and it just, sometimes you're just affected with it. 
and um, and it's 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 no rhyme or reason. It's cheap itis, and and I'm not calling anyone. Cheap. I don't know who gives, so I can say this and, and to myself to mirror anything else. Cheap itis. I just don't want to give because I have LOL next to my nose. By the way, I'm, I'm half kidding, and um, because it's um, because I just think, hey, you know, I don't want to give because I don't want to give, and I like my money. I like I like keeping all of God's money. I know how I worded that. So that's one reason, pure and simple, why some people don't give. Another reason, I think a bigger reason than that is, and this permeates much more than our wallets, my friends, is fear. Especially in a day, 2014 in America, fear is a common commodity in people's lives. Many people live their lives being fear-driven, fear of the future. You know, we were created with certain needs, Love, affirmation, acceptance, significance, all these, uh, depending on what author you want to read. And, um, and those needs are protected. They want to be met. And one of these things is fear. Security is one of the biggest needs that people have, especially ladies. I want to feel some sort of financial security. Now, let me share a few things about fear, and I'll move on. Fear of any kind is rarely defeated without facing it. You can run from it, and it'll chase you. You can hide from it, it'll find you. Talking to Norman Wright after we lost Hannah, we um, obviously very traumatic things happened that day. And Norman Wright's one of the, probably the most respected um, trauma, grief counselor maybe in the world, in the country anyway. He's retired now, and he heard of what happened, and he actually called me on the phone. I had two conversations with him, and he said, he told me, I talked about some of the, uh, fears that had crept into my life. He said, you know, Tim, um, I have learned, I've learned that when we face them, you defang them. When you face these fears, you take the teeth out of them. And how do you face them? You face them. If, the fear, if you have a fear of going left, you go left. If you have a fear of going right, you go right. If you have a fear of this, you face it. You name it and you isolate it. Because you won't defeat it until you've had a showdown with it. Running from a fear and submitting to it keeps the fear as the dictator of your lives. And whatever that fear is, it must be confronted with truth, with action. If there is a fear of giving, not necessarily a giving, but a fear of security that would cause you to compromise what God would ask you to do, then face it. I know for me, I hate being controlled by anything but the Lord. When God has raised the bar so high in my life, so high in my life, when He's given me all things that pertain unto life and godliness, when He says I'm an, I'm a recipient of all spiritual blessings, I hate anything down here to control me. I hate anything on on, on a human level to rob my convictions and take my joy. The third thing that causes people not to give is a kingdomless view of life. Um, they don't see their money as really God's, and they see their kingdom sometimes. This is subtle and sometimes not real um, obvious to us, but we see it as a temporal and not eternal. In other words, I don't see where God, you know, needs my money, or I don't see the value of giving it to a church or to a, a, however we give it. Rick Warren said years ago, about 10 years ago, so maybe less, and I believe it to be true, if every church in America, the American church, gave a simple 10% of their income, world hunger could be, rel could be eliminated almost immediately. The infrastructure is there to do it. We know how to get the food. We just don't have the resources. I know that's not going to happen, but that's how much financial power the American church has. Listen, I got some good news. God does not want all his money back. He just wants a little of it. Whatever, however God, you, God leads you to give, we know there's a 10% thing in the Old Testament of tithing, but actually if you look at the Old Testament, it's closer to 28 to 30% when you put in all the temple taxes and everything else. I don't necessarily, I'm more of a grace-giving mentality. I believe we should give through the grace of God and the joy of giving. God loves a cheerful giver. 10% um, is a great place to start, and it's a great launching pad, and you can adjust that personally, and we don't track those things, and I'll never track them. I do not know 
in gears. I never will. I'll never learn. I don't want to know. I'm just saying that there is, um, God has given us plenty in the scriptures to go by. And he just asks for a little of it back. Now, with that said, enough on money. Now, I want to get into what the last point really here is um, Colossians chapter 2. Because we have inside your wallet, you have restaurant cards, you have credit cards, you have cash, you have um, AAA cards. I'm trying to go through my wallet. You have tax-exempt Best Buy cards and, um, and stuff. And then you have this, driver's license or your ID. Now, the last time you went to a liquor store, when was that, last night? Or, no, never mind. <coughs> no, 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 put your arm, put your arm down, Bob. No, I don't. <laughs> Sheesh, I, I told you I wasn't going to tell anybody. My goodness. He, he, was, he, he, was, he was just buying something for Jeanette. <laughs> now, there's, there is, <laughs> there is, um, we, when last time I went there, and they, they, they carded me. They said, I want to see your ID. And so this is my identification. This is, this tells my name, my address, um, what I used to look like with hair, and, and, and stuff like that. It's all, it's, <laughs> it's all on there. Now, let me read this. Colossians 2.12. Having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and this uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses. Wonderful verse, parallel verse of Romans 6, 1 through 4. Number one thing we don't baptize, I believe, in the church today, universal, is our identity in Christ. There's a lot of Christians walking around in a natural identity. This is who I am because this is how I was raised, and this is what my parents did for me or didn't do for me. This is how they treated me or didn't treat me. Um, this is this event that happened into my life. These are the, the, the legacy of bad decisions I made or good decisions to make, whatever. However, each life has played out, and that really becomes our launching pad, our identity. Neil Anderson said this, being separated from God... Adam and Eve had no choice but to seek their identity and purpose in the physical realm. What he's referring to there, if you read further on in that paragraph, he says basically this, when we, when we were born into the world, I should say this, when, when, when Adam and Eve were created, God breathed his life inside of them. The breath of God filled Adam's lungs. And Adam had these needs that he didn't even know he had. And Eve had these needs she didn't know she had. They had this need for love, but that need for love was met by the Lord. They had this need for security. That need was met by the Lord. They had a need for significance. That need was met by the Lord. In fact, you affirmation, acceptance, all those basic human needs, they were all met by the Lord. They didn't know what a need was. They walked in perfect fellowship with the, with, with the Lord. Then sin came into the picture. And this upward glance, where everything was fulfilled and satisfied, went horizontal. Adam looked at Eve and said, meet my knees. And Eve looked at Adam and said, meet my knees. Then they looked at children, meet my knees. Look at the world system, meet my needs. When the answer for those needs was still being met, was, was, could only still be met vertically. We go talk about this a lot in our marriage university. So now I get, I look at these, whatever those needs are, and it's going to be different for you and me and different programming for all of us. If I don't get them, if that man in my life or that woman in my life doesn't come through in this area or that area, I'm not happy. So I'm going to manipulate them. I'm going to get mad at them. I'm going to do whatever it takes so they will meet my needs. And we grope around and we grope around because that's where my identity is. A good way of figuring out where your identity is is to ask yourself a simple question. Honestly to yourself. Who am I? And your answer to that will be a good barometer of your spiritual core. I am Tim Kelly, fill in the blank. I am this. I'm an addicted person. I'm an abused person. I'm a lustful person. I'm a successful person. I'm a fill-in-the-blank, insecure, unfulfilled, unbecoming, unlovable, 
fill in the blank, lonely. That becomes my starting point. That becomes the answer to that question, who am I? God knew that, my friend. That's why he gave us that. He gave us a cross. He says, in that cross, I can fix your identity problem. I can resurrect everything. Just like we read in Colossians chapter 2, we go to Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6, same thing. He says, so you see, when I died, you died with me. When I was buried, your old person was buried with me. When I resurrected, you resurrected as into new life. And now with me, Ephesians 2, 6, you're seated together with me now in the heavenly place. I've given you a new starting point. I've given you a new launching pad. My old identity has passed away, and God gave me, it gives me a brand new starting point, a brand new identity. Thus, these, these are old, stale doctrines, I say that with tongue-in-cheek, like justification. God declared you righteous. When he justified you, he looked at you and said, I'm declaring you righteous. Not because you are righteous, because I'm giving you the righteousness of my, of my son, Jesus Christ. So you'll stand in his righteousness because you don't have any. But, so I'm going to give you his righteousness by you saying yes to me and believing on me by faith. I'm placing you in my son, Jesus. And at that point, you'll stand before me in unmitigated acceptance. And then I'm going to take on the process of Philippians 1, 6, of conforming you, Romans 8, 29, into my image. Sanctification. I'll take the work of making you more like me. That's not even going to be your efforts. That's going to be my spirit working through you. I'm going to regenerate you. I'm going to take my spirit and put it inside of you that this work of sanctification can take place through, through this spirit, my life, my dynamo, that's the word, dy- this dynamite light that I put inside of you, Zoe life, eternal life that I put inside of you. I will do the work. Just stay close to me and watch it happen. Then we're adopted into his family. I love the adoption. Because it's a picture of all, once again, all my old stuff going away and me taking on the identity of a brand new family with my old identity disappearing. He adopted us. And inside that word adoption is this tenderness and this love and this acceptance and this affirmation of a family and this um, all of the above inside of adoption. Changing me from a walking dead man to a man of life, eternal life. Listen, I'm going to close. I'll use my dog illustration. I have a dog. Give or take a dog. I mean, it's, a, it's white, and it's, um, it barks a lot. I, uh, it might even be meowing. I'm not, I'm not sure. But it's, it, when you look it up online, they say it's a dog. Okay? And, and, then, and then I have other dogs that I met, like Jasper has a dog, and he's what type of dog? He's a boxer, right? And he weighs 85 pounds. And he barks. He almost bit me one time. <laughs> and um, and he, when he barks, you hear him. He's Whoa, baritone. My dog, my dog barks in soprano. <laughs> and, and when he barks, he has these laminate floors, which make it just painful. He has painful. And so, but when you look online, there's a, this, my, my little dog's a dog, and, and my little, and his dog's a dog. And, and, and you look at sinners, same way. Sinners. The little white ones, yappers, nippers. <laughs> then you have the baritone, big old sinners. Those are the ones that we know they sin. I mean, we know. It's on the billboard. Yeah, I sinned. <laughs> and um, we know it. They're, they're grotesque, blue-collar, down-and-dirty sinners. And there's no question, because our little white-collar, yappy dog sinners, we like to look at them and say, yeah, they're sinners for sure. But we can't, but we forget a little bit, that little white fluffy yappy dog center, it's every bit, they're still the same species. This different look, different appearance, different manifestation. The little white yappy dog center needs as much grace as the big old dog center. The baritone center. 
And myself, my friends, my, my identity doesn't get placed in what type of dog I am. My identity gets placed in who I've been made through the blood of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. So I'm, I'm a yappy dog sinner or a big old barking dog sinner. doesn't matter. That's not my starting point anymore. My starting point is that. The cross of Jesus Christ made me new and called me a new creature. So when I get baptized, my identity goes down with me and comes up resurrected with me my friends if you've never baptized your identity do it today somehow take your driver's license out baptize it whatever you got to do to get it across to your head but um but um in jesus name the the holy spirit and and whatever you got to do but baptize that baby and and walk up with a new life and understand that's not who i am i am not what happened to me when i was six i'm not what happened to me when i was eight i'm not my poor parents what they did or did not do for me i'm not that event that happened to me when i was 12 i'm not my bad decisions i'm not my addiction i'm not my 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 sin that besets me i'm none of those things i am who jesus christ breathed life to me a new creature in jesus christ that's a baptized identity If you are baptized, that identity, the the family baptism will come right in place. The money baptism will come right in place. Everything else will fall right in place if that baptism is understood. And And my friends, if I can just boil it down and close, that's what Paul calls a glorious gospel. And that's why it's amazing. That's why it's glorious, because it is extended to you and it's extended to me. And there is no human that has ever walked in the face uh, face of the earth since the cross, but didn't have the same unmitigated potential to walk in the newness of life, Romans 6, 4, as a brand new creature in Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus, thank you for these words and these precious people, and we pray a blessing on this rest of this service. And if you're here this morning or on the webcast and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, we'd like to give you that opportunity right now, the quiet place of your heart. In your own words, say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me.